Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of CIO Programs here at IDG, and I'm very pleased today to have with us Bob Fecto, who is the soon-to-be-retired and former CIO and Senior Vice President of SAIC. Bob is transitioning into retirement now after six years as CIO of SAIC, which stands for Science Applications International Corp., although he tells me no one calls it that anymore. It is kind of a mouthful. He joined the company back in 2013. It is headquartered in Reston, Virginia, and has 23,000 employees in the U.S. and annual revenues of upwards of $6.5 billion. SAIC primarily serves the federal government, defense intelligence, and space markets as a premier technology integrator. It provides everything from high-end systems engineering and integration work to enterprise IT support and advanced analytics. It has a small business in state and local governments, and a tiny bit of its revenue uh, comes from the commercial sector. During his tenure as CIO at SAIC, Bob rebuilt the IT organization, renovated key business systems and applications, and integrated an acquired company. And probably the piece that he did that mattered the most to his CEO and his CFO is that every year for the last six years, he provided approximately $40 million in additional savings and cost reductions. As Bob likes to say, he turned the IT organization from the Department of No into the Department of How. Before he joined SAIC, Bob spent seven years as the CIO of BAE Systems Intelligence and Security Group. And then in the early 2000s, he served as the first ever CIO for the U.S. Army Intelligence and Security Command. Bob is one of the founding members of the leadership development program called Pathways that is part of our own CIO Executive Council, and last year he was inducted into our CIO Hall of Fame. I'm especially pleased to get the chance today to tap into Bob's great expertise on so many topics that are close to CIO hearts, and especially some of his more controversial and strongly held opinions about the CIO role itself. Today we'll be talking about topics such as why all CIOs should have an elevator pitch about their role and their job and what they do ready to go, about why business leaders today, especially CEOs and senior executives on the top committees, need to become a lot more fluent in IT than they are today, and then finally what CIOs need to do to become master architects of the company's technology investments. Bob, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Mary Fran. It's always good to see you. All right. Now, before we dive into all that acquired wisdom I've been talking about, I wanted, to, I wanted you to take us back about 20 years to the Y2K crisis and talk about how that shifted or rather opened up your career path in new directions toward what it was eventually the CIO role. Uh, sure. Uh, in, in 1997, I was called from the field to go to the Pentagon to work as the systems integration manager for Army Intel Systems. Mm -hmm. And the sole job was we were having all these technology systems delivered to us, and they weren't connected to a network. They didn't have the training, and they still didn't have all the pieces and parts connected together. So as the systems integration manager, my job was to connect all of it together before it left the factory and got to the field where the soldiers could use it most effectively. Mm -hmm. So just about the middle of that process, uh, 1998 came about and uh, they called me up one day and said, hey, you know anything about Y2K? <laughs> yeah. So the next thing you know, uh, I was deep into Y2K and the responsibilities I had were over the 54 major Intel systems that were resident in the U.S. Army at the time. Mm -hmm. And we actually had to do some severe modification to a lot of them, uh, mostly related to message handling. Um, if you didn't know this, most of the messages in the uh, Army Intel system actually work automated. So they, they get published and produced all without any human interaction. Mm -hmm. When you code those systems with only a two-year date, when you got to 1999, they wouldn't know which year they were in. They would yeah. go back to 2000. And all the advanced uh, machine learning systems that we have at the time mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to correlate a, 2000, a 00 date to a 99 date. So we renovated all the message handling capabilities for the Army Intel system. And that was about 
we r- roughly estimate somewhere around 650 million lines of code were renovated over the 24 month process that I was involved in the program. Wow. And it resulted in zero failure um, mm-hmm. in our systems. And we actually got to watch around the globe how all the systems came up online and pro- operated properly. So it was, yeah. I think what it really taught me was about complexity, mm-hmm. distilling down to action, and from action, delivering results that make a difference in the mission of the organization, okay. which, by the way, is the CIO's role. Well, yeah, and, and you also told me that after you'd done that, you felt like after Y2K, you could do anything. Yeah. It's like surviving yeah. that. And you, you also mentioned that you noticed around that time there was an article about Dawn Lepore, who was the CIO at Schwab, and how she was doing all this very impressive work, taking Schwab from a bricks and mortar company to something more on the web. And you started thinking to yourself, I would like to do that too. It wasn't all that altruistic. Uh, she got a $22 million bonus that year. And I said, man, I'd like some of that. <laughs> so I said, yeah, that's, that's a pretty probably, good bonus. But realistically, what she did is she enabled the organization to change itself yeah. through the application of technology. And I found out that that's something that I have a skill at. I, mm-hmm. I can tie people to the technology and make a difference in how they work every day. So that, to me, is really what being the CIO is all about. Okay, excellent. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So I will fast forward you back to today. And we'll start getting some of your perspectives on the CIO role. One of the things you said to me about that was that the first job of every CIO is to decide what their job is. And that a lot of the CIOs you talk to often don't have that very terse and well assembled elevator pitch. Why is that so important? And what is your elevator pitch? Well, let's talk about why it's important first. Mm -hmm. Um, The reason it's important is because one of the problems that the business has with CIOs is they always say that we speak too technically. And that's mostly because it's hard to put the value of technology in its nascent form as it's growing and evolving for the business into a value that the business understands in itself. Mm -hmm. So we are the we are the glue that connects that together between the value and what the business gets for its investment in technology. So that's kind of why you have to have the elevators pitch about what's going on with technology helping the business operate better. Okay. So you want to know my elevator pitch? Yeah. And so as the CIO for SAIC, I'm responsible for all of the IT spend in the organization, every dime of it, whether I spend it or not. That includes the shadow IT, the offline investment IT, the credit card purchases. I'm Mm -hmm. responsible for the accounting of all of that technology spend. Okay. I may not spend it. And in many cases, there are some type places that I don't know what's going on, but I'm still responsible as the chief information officer to understand what that expenditure rate is so that we accurately predict what the investment portfolio has to be to maintain and sustain a viable, intel, uh, viable uh, technology base to keep the company running. Okay. Now, in the six years that you were at SAIC as the CIO, how long did it take you to get essentially to get honed in on that mission, uh, on that particular elevator pitch and that, and keeping track of all of the spending in the company for technology? Well, I think, I think the first two years were really storming and norming as we split the company from its legacy mm-hmm. ownership into two separate companies. Um, I, I'd say within 18 months, we had the idea that accounting all the assets and accounting for all the costs was the was job one. Yeah. It, it was certainly during the split that we had to figure out how much we needed because during the split, the estimates of the amount of money that they gave us to split the company were inadequate to run the business the way it needed to run in the future state. Mm-hmm. So the financial underpinnings for this have grown, gone back way back to Y2K, understanding how much it took to run the Army's uh, Intel systems. And then when I went to BAE systems, I got a chance to test and fail a couple of concepts there. Mm -hmm. All of them eventually surround this concept of financial acumen. And they're all driven by a need to be relevant in the business financially. If I can't maintain a budget, if I can't accurately predict the cost, if Mm -hmm. I underrun or overrun my plan, I affect the business. They either don't spend money they should be spending or they spend too much money they didn't want to spend on technology. And I cause them to be reactive as opposed to predictive. Yeah. And that's the job of the CIO is to be predictive about where we're going with technology. Mm-hmm. 
Well, and it's and as we know, it's a very difficult job because technology changes so quickly, especially today. I know at one of our past events, you gave a talk about the importance of asset management and how you run into far too many chief uh, information officers that don't have a great grip on all the stuff that they have. Maybe and now nowadays it'd be everything in their network plus all of their um, cloud operations. Sure. So asset management to me is a you know, first of all, you have to understand my background. I'm an Intel specialist by training. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we do in the Intel world is order things up in an order of battle kind of function when we count the enemy trucks and vehicles and people. Well, when you're trying to fund something, if you don't know exactly how many pieces you have to fund, mm -hmm. it's really hard to put a predictable number down on the table yeah. and then understand whether you got the right number. So if you look in most of the IT organizations, they don't really understand how many systems are supposed to be there. This, com this complexity in asset management is very critical for the future. Mm -hmm. It's been important now to get in the right money to put the right technology to help the business grow. But tomorrow, it's going to be really important because that system's not supposed to be on the network. If you don't know what you got and you don't know which systems have to be on the network and which ones shouldn't, the cyber mission explodes exponentially in complexity when you don't do it right. Okay. And asset management is the cornerstone foundation for all of this. In the beginning of the CIO cycle, we were hearing about you have the as is and the to be and the future state. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't know what you got, you have no idea where you're going, right. in my impression. Uh -huh. and, and my belief is the more accurate you are with the uh, systems that you know, when someone says, I want something else to do and I wanted to do something different, your ability to predict the cost and the investment it's going to take to achieve those results Exponent, it is ex exponentially better because you, you've done a good job at the blocking and tackling of the core mission of asset management for the CIO. Okay. And of course, asset management is not, it, it's not new programs and new software. There have been capabilities around for this for probably the last 15 to 20 years. Oh, well, more than that. Even more than if that. If you think back mm -hmm. to the technology we started with, we started with, uh, HP OpenView for the network side. Mm -hmm. You used systems management server from Microsoft for the Microsoft side. You used uh, a whole bunch of OpNet to track the network stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and, eventually, and truthfully, the data is there. It just takes a master architect to seam it together to make value out of information, yeah. which, by the way, is the very digital journey that all businesses are on anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So the IT department has to go in the same direction as, as the business does. Okay. Well, and in some cases, they also need to lead the business in where it's going these days. I think we talk That's a lot true. about that strategically. Um, I like that you mentioned uh, master architect because that gives me a great segue to my next question about your conviction that CIOs need to be the master architect of the tech investment for the whole company because, as you pointed out, after HR, it's the biggest investment the company makes. Makes, but so many companies still seem to see the chief financial officer as the master architect of investment decisions. So uh, talk a little bit about that. What can CIOs, what the, should they be doing to shift that perception? Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough, in some companies, that's a tough mission. Yeah. Uh, the reality is, is that um, if you let the CFO dictate which technologies you're going to employ to better the business, then I question whether you're in the right job. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the CIO's job, the chief information officer's job, to figure out the direction that the business needs to go with the technology it needs to be successful. It's not the CFO's job. It's not the CHRO's job. It's not even the CTO's job. It's the CIO's responsibility to paint the picture of the art of the possible and manage the investment portfolio necessary to achieve that picture in a way that benefits a business every single day. Anything short of that, and I, I subject, I would surmise that you're probably not a full vetted CIO. Okay. That's how I see it. Sure. Okay. We, uh, we got a question from some of our live watchers on Twitter, and we're delighted to have it. Uh, the question is, what platforms or technologies did you use to give those predictions? And I believe we were talking about asset management. So it was around... Okay, so asset management is, is a bunch of systems. So you actually connect your HP OpenView, your Cisco Works, and your uh, Microsoft System Center together 
there, for instance, System Center has 644 data elements that come out of it per system. Mm -hmm. If you can't do something with that data authoritatively, then you know, you're probably not in the right job, technically. But okay. uh, you take that information, you synthesize it together to a business outcome, right? So that's what my job is. Yeah. So I, I gathered all the HP OpenView, I gathered all the IP ports, I gathered all that stuff and put it into an integrated database and did query structures across it. I, I didn't take outputs from all of those. I mapped them all together into one integrated view. Mm -hmm. And then we used uh, you know, uh, Oracle BI Suite to actually connect the data together. And now we're using uh, MS Dynamics to actually give us some, a little bit of BI insight into when things are working and the way they work. So we'll get the timing down, when that system should be online, when it should be offline. Mm -hmm. And is there something coming in on its address that it shouldn't be at, at a certain point in time? Yeah. We also map and measure all the interfaces for all the systems. So we know which system should be talking to which uh, end systems at what time. And if something anomalous comes out, our security center actually alerts on those kind of things. Okay. That's what I mean by linking it all together. Mm -hmm. And today we take that output and we put it into a platform called Aptio. Aptio is a software that um, delivers an integrated solution for technology business management. Yeah. which is the CIO's job, is technology business management of the information resource elements of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. That's my job. So by, by taking the assets, connecting them into the asset management suite, the asset management database connects into a TBM and to ServiceNow. We know what system we're looking at, how much it's cost to run it, how many service tickets it's had over the period, and then we can tell whether it's a logical replacement. And even better, if you use... BI and ML learning, you can look at the inventory you have and you can start to see lot failures on hardware that's come into the enterprise. So mm -hmm. you can start to work with your vendor, like I work with Dell, say, look, this series of hard drives has failed faster than they should have. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna wait for all 400 of them to fail. Send me 400 hard drives and we'll replace them proactively. Dell likes that interaction. That is the way Dell wants to operate. That's okay. the way IT internal needs to operate. Mm -hmm. So that's tying your logistics supply chain through your end user into your uh, instrumentation system and your asset management all predicted against a cost model that's in your technology business management suite. So you link it all together. Now you have an ecosystem that helps you run and operate the IT system. Okay. Well, and I know, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit in what we were going to talk about, but I wanted to dive in a little bit more to talk about the TBM Council that you mentioned, Technology sure. Business Management, um, because TBM Council is a nonprofit organization. It was created by the uh, tech vendor company Aptio. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And it's got a lot of very forward-thinking CIOs and senior IT executives who operate under this mission of essentially running IT like a business, promoting business management standards and practices to empower everyone. Um, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about how did you find this framework and uh, is it, I, I know the U.S. government is using it extensively at this point. Right. So the government accounting office has mandated the use of uh, TBM architectural planning as part of the financial accounting methodology uh, for the federal government. So it's going to become a very uh, in vogue concept as we move forward. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I've been in the CIO Executive Council for a long time. Mm -hmm. Ralph Laura was on the council with me and I met, uh, I was meeting with him and Rebecca Jacoby from Cisco. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned the technology business management framework they were working on with the CEO from Aptio, Sunny Gupta. Sunny Gupta was putting a software application together and mm -hmm. found that they need an architecture and a framework to put this thing to work against so that we could get one of the most critical problems we have in the CIO world is consistency in practice from one place to another. Yes. So TBM provides the framework that ties together all the things I've talked about, asset management, financial accountability, service delivery, towers of management, mm -hmm. the distribution of IT across the enterprise, how it's all tied together, how it's linked together. And by using this framework, which is becoming universally acceptable, we will end up with consistent uh, practices, which will go a long way to maturing the future of this profession. Yes. I know that's, that's something that is very near and dear to your heart because you've you have heard you talk about how uh, when a CFO goes into a company, there's particular processes and standards and things that are going to be there because, of course, the CFO yeah. profession has been around since the late 1920s, I think. 
Whereas the no, s- it's a day of an abacus. The, huh? Well, it got a, it's got its name, I think, after the Great Depression. Um, but CIOs have technically really only been around since maybe the 1980s. So it's still a relatively term, fresh-faced profession, isn't it? Yeah, the term was coined in 1981, but it became a practice in 1998 as a part of when the federal government mandated CIO functionality in its agencies. Yeah. It was codified under a law called the Clean Air Cohen Act. Mm-hmm. And from that, it mandated that you had uh, IT leaders in the leadership divisions of all the agencies of the government so that they would actually be able to manage the second largest expenditure the company makes in itself yeah. or the agency or the organization. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a very we're a nascent new organization and we've only had four educational cycles of college that has produced anybody that has had the right background for information resource management end to end. Mm hmm. And if you want to draw a parallelism, you can look at the cyberspace. The yeah. cyberspace is eight to ten years behind the CIO space. So you're seeing you're seeing so many new product offerings and concepts because arguably even the CISO space has not been stabilized yet. Mm-hmm. So everything is up in the air for when for the next great idea and silver bullet that's gonna fix everything. Yeah. Well, those things come with maturity, and maturity comes with educational platforms driven by mission essential needs. That are brought back into a codification. Okay. The well, let's talk a little bit more about kind of the rising complexities around today's CIO role. It 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 it, it seems to me that it has been the complexity issues, and the number of factions and and parts of the company CIOs have to deal with has increased greatly in the last three or four years, especially. Uh, it, am I? Would you agree with that? And to what do we owe that? <laughs> why is that? Why is that happening? Why is complexity increasing for the CIOs in their roles? Uh, one of our uh, a, a figure from our 2019 State of the CIO research: uh, something like more than 80 percent of CIOs now have significant responsibilities outside of the IT function. So it's not like you can just be expert in technology asset management or in your processes or operations. You've got to have expertise expanding into a lot of business areas now. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. In fact, this one of the reasons the complexity has increased so much is if you think about the role of the CIO in applying technology universally across the business, it's the one place you can go and have a horizontal, complete view of the business. In, yeah. Within SEIC, I'm blessed. Uh, my my CEO, Tony Morocco, has green-lighted me to do the mission as I see it needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And that means I can disassemble any of the business processes with inside of the company and apply technology if it's going to improve it. And and that that's the complexity you start to talk about. Yeah. The second complexity that's related to it is for every idea that you as the CIO think, there's 500, 600,000 people around the globe to think they can do it better. And all these new products come mm-hmm. out. And the reality is, is that they don't always come into the space uh, with a solution that plugs right into the into the outlet. Yeah. You know, if you don't believe that's true, just look at a universal, uh, UB, uh, universal um, serial bus cable, USB cable. Mm-hmm. One thing I can tell you is a USB cable is not universal. Nope. There's C, yeah, many, there's micro, USB-C yeah, and B and yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a good example of how, mm-hmm. how fast the technology changes. And if that's not enough to convince you, think about how many different power supplies you have for so many different devices mm-hmm. that, I mean, you can look in your drawer and figure out, I don't know what that cable went to. And that's because <laughs> when we start talking about standards, you know, we haven't disciplined ourselves into what is a standard, you know, and how do we make that standard more universal? Yeah. So that's where complexity is coming from. Mm-hmm. And the CIO's job is to take those very complex concepts and turn them into something someone can execute and do effectively over and over again. Yeah. Because, you know, doing it once is, is pretty basic. Mm-hmm. Doing it 16,000 times for every change and making 16,000 people do it right that's very complex. Yeah. Well, and it's often the company culture and the way people are responding to technology that makes the CIO's job either easier to do or a lot more difficult. Yeah. 
you know, SAIC is a challenge for a different reason. I have 10,000 IT professionals in the line. Uh, and every one of those guys thinks they can do the IT better than the, guy, the folks that I have delivering it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very interesting until you bring them in there and start teaching them how hard it is to deliver enterprise services for an IT company or really a high tech company yeah. in a way that is going to satisfy most of the people. See, that's the funny thing. My job's not to satisfy all the people. Right. My job is to provide a, a foundation that allows the business to run effectively and manages the one-offs as well as it manages the center. And, you know, mm-hmm. I try to balance the haves with the have-nots on a regular basis. Well, and we had a, a when we were talking a few days ago to get ready for this interview, uh, you had mentioned, you know, we talked about the, uh, I think it was one of the procurement processes that you've had, you know, because if CIOs were completely guided by everything their customers want and their end user base, you could end up doing a lot of, well, a lot of stupid stuff. Like it, you use the example of an expensive procurement item that uh, people wanted to be able to just do that on their phones. Sure. Yeah. The procurement team came to me and said, hey, would you like to, uh, we, I said, what can I do to help you? And of course they said, well, you could make this uh, form, the approval for, pro- for procurement on a mobile phone. I said, you're kidding, right? And they said, no, no, we want the VPs to be able to approve it on their phone. Mm-hmm. I said, the last time you sent me a procurement document on my main screen in the computer, I had to leave through like five pages. Nobody's going to do that on a form factor as small as a postage stamp. Mm-hmm. And you want them to make multi-million dollar decisions based on data that you're going to put on a, on a telephone screen? I said, I think that you really have to look at what you want them to do and the purpose you want behind it. Because yeah. we can make very fast, very bad decisions really quick yeah. if we don't do the right process analysis about what we have people doing and why we want them to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, and another one of the big ongoing challenges uh, for CIOs, and this has been going on for quite a long time, it's all the proliferation of those chief, the other chief roles that take various <laughs> aspects. Ha ha, I, I know this is a big hot button with you. Uh, the various aspects of technology. You've got, of course, CTO, the chief technology officers. You've got chief digital officers that started showing up in the last few years. There's the CSO that often feels like they need their own organization and their own reporting relationship with the board. Uh, chief data officers are new. And I hear chief innovation officer a lot these days, too. And literally with chief digital or innovation officers, their background and training is all over the map. It could be all kinds of different disciplines. So everybody, everybody wants to, how did you put it? Everybody wants to have their seat at the table. But what does that do to the CIO role? Well, first of all, the thing that people have to keep in mind is every time you create a chief, you create a staff. Every time you create a staff, you dilute the finances available to execute. Yeah. And let me explain. When the CD is chief, when the CEO decides he wants a chief digital officer, you don't think he's taking his budget to make the chief digital officer's office and his assistant and all the other people that work with him. It's got the word digital in this it. This is where the CIO <laughs> role gets really complex. It's coming out of the IT budget. Yeah. Or it's going to come out of HR, but they're already under resourced anyway. So, you know, it's certainly not coming out of finance and mm-hmm. it's not going to come out of the CEO's budget. Mm-hmm. So you're going to take an already precious, already limited budget that runs at the very edge of the margin for IT service support. You're going to further dilute it with a bunch of executives, chief knowledge officer, chief digital officer, chief technology mm-hmm. officer, and they're all going to have a desire to put their stamp on the ground for what they're going to accomplish in their period. And what assets do you think those guys are going to have to use when they do their thing, whatever that thing happens to be? Mm-hmm. They're going to use the IT staff, which their missions are now going to conflict with the CIO's mission, which is going to conflict with the business's mission. And when you start getting to that kind of complexity, you can't take a hundred bucks and divide it 50 ways and think it's going to be better than a hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. Just never going to work that way. So, you know, and that thing, it kind of jazzes me off. It really gets me going. <laughs> but the second part that gets me going is this one. Most often, 
you know, I, I think they're riding in the airplane where I ride, and they read some article in a book on the. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to read in the mat and the on the uh, airplane, mm -hmm. but they don't read mm -hmm. anymore. They watch video, and it says you should get a C, You know, good CEOs are getting chief digital officers. Yeah, yeah. To do the very thing the CIO is supposed to do, and yet the CEO never asked them to do it. So they're going to hire a new executive to go do a role that's really the CIO's role. And if your CIO can't do that role, then you should get a new CIO, really, mm -hmm. in my picture. But but, but it's isn't, bad. But isn't, isn't it also, doesn't some of this blame have to uh, turn back on the CIO? Because if they're not speaking up, if they're not going to the CEO and saying, you know, having strategic conversations about uh, what's going on with digital transformation in their industry or things there, because they're reading magazines and, you know, websites as well. Um, so I often think that that kind of speaks to both ends of it. You know, maybe the CEO is suffering from fear of missing out, but in a lot of ways, the CIOs are missing out by not being... I don't know, aggressive enough about that. And in in another way, that's very unfair of me to say, because the CIO job is pretty overweighted right now with responsibilities. Yeah, Mary Fran, I, th I think you've hit a good point. I don't think aggressive is the right term to use. I think that the concept of partnering with the business and agreeing with the business where we need to go together on a regular basis is the responsibility of the CIO to develop the right strategy. Okay. It gets to, it gets diffused because all too often the comp the business wants to treat technology as a um, utility. Utility. But mm -hmm. it's not a utility. Uh, it's much different than electricity. Mm -hmm. You know, electricity is a utility. You come in and you plug things in, it runs. You can plug whatever you want in the IT system. If you don't have some tech people behind you helping to make it work, it's not going to go very well. And then they're going to blame IT for the failure. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you in a little inside secret. You, we've heard all along that uh, technology uh, um, investments fail at about 80%. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've worked with a very talented group of individuals in both BAE and SAIC. And my experience has been exactly the opposite. I can tell you this for a fact. The IT teams are well disciplined. They're highly skilled at prog project and program management. Mm -hmm. They usually deliver the application, the solution, and the system exactly or better than on budget and on time. Mm -hmm. And when you give it to the business and tell them they have to do their part, they very seldom do that. Mm -hmm. They don't do the training. They won't do the change management. And they won't make changes to the organization reflecting the way the system is designed to operate. So then we go into... The customization cycle and make it try to fit the way we used to do it yeah now we're talking about where the leakages start to happen on the efficiency of technology supporting a business mm -hmm. and that's this is some of the root of what the problem is the reason the cio gets overshadowed and put in and they bring in the chief knowledge or chief digital officer mm -hmm. is most often because he's overwhelmed doing the day-to-day -day job the business itself can't even define mm -hmm. and and then we, they decide they want to go in a different direction. They don't even bother to consult them. I think in order to get in the game, you've got to keep your head in the game. You've got to understand what's going on with the business, where they're trying to go, how they want to get there, and then bring the opportunities and, op and offers to them that they can understand and make sense out of. Mm -hmm. Why do you think... I, if I need a chief digital officer, I'll hire one. Yeah. Why do you think so many CIOs end up in that kind of a defensive position, though? Is it because they are two heads down and trying to get everything working and all the processing. I mean, it's a lot in the job. I, you know, when I hear, yeah. I talk with CIOs all the time, and when they start describing the kind of stuff that they have to do every day, it just sounds so damn overwhelming. Um, yeah, well, it can be overwhelming. I, I think that's why you want a seasoned professional at this level doing that kind of job. Okay. They have to be able to distill out what's the most important stuff and what's not. Mm -hmm. And if you can't help your teams prioritize in those fashions, if you can't teach them to be independent thinkers, then I, it's questionable whether you got your, you're doing the right job. Mm -hmm. You know, I, frankly, I've got a talented group of people right behind me, and I'm not worried about it at all every day. Yeah. We run very, very well. Mm -hmm. Well, you have what sort of leadership development and training did you make sure to provide during your, your years as CIO there at SAIC? What, what do you think worked the best? Well, you know, it's a, it's an, it's a 
there's a couple things. I mentor for the CIO Pathways program, mm -hmm. people outside. And one of my one of my uh, team members came to me and said, you do it outside, why don't you do it for us inside? I thought, well, that's a good point. Well, why mm -hmm. don't we do that? So I started running uh, every six months a mentor program for up and coming leaders with inside my own IT organization. Okay. And I mentored them along and I used the structured program, the semi-structured program from Pathways to create a platform for me to move that agenda down the path. Mm -hmm. I also send them to Pathways so they get the external view of, from another CIO about how things can work better and how things could be different. Yeah. And then, you know, as we walk down the path, I find that uh, I regularly collaborate with other CIOs and I will offer my folks the opportunity to go talk to them as well. And I find the CIO community is willing to participate in that kind of exchange on a regular basis. Yeah. We technically train them. We leadership train them. We communications train them. We focus on the training that's going to make a humanistic uh, difference in the way they apply their job skills. Yeah. And from that, we've grown some, I think, some very outstanding leaders. And, mm -hmm. you know, as I look to depart, I'm very happy with, with what's left behind yeah. and where they'll go and take the organization. Will they do it the way I'm going to do it? It's unreasonable to expect that that's going to happen. Will they do it well? Mm -hmm. I have every expectation they will do it well in their light, in their picture. Yeah. And that's another point that I would say to, to other leaders that are looking at developing their crew. Mm -hmm. You got to understand they're never going to be able to do it the way you do it. They can only do it the way they can do it. Yeah. And your job is to give them the best tools to do it to the best of their ability, not your ability. Mm -hmm. That's a tough thing for leaders to focus on. That's a great point. That's a great point. Do you think that the leadership and the people development kind of skills, are they more important now than they might have been a few years ago for CIOs and for VPs of IT just in general? Oh, I, I absolutely do. Okay. I think I think our inability to communicate across the, the age groups that we're talking about, you know, we hear about the millennial challenge and all that stuff. I don't know how you figure out the value proposition or the value that the, that the people that are working with you place on those kind of challenges if you don't understand generationally, mm -hmm. if you can't communicate effectively, if you can't distill down to human, uh, human value structures, how do you make people perform their best? See, my job is not to make you successful when you come here. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. My job is to provide you a platform for you to achieve the maximum success possible when you apply yourself. Yeah. Notice I didn't say if you don't apply yourself. Mm -hmm. If you apply yourself, my job is to give you a platform to grow mm -hmm. yourself to the maximum of your potential. And it's up to you to decide what that potential is going to be, not me to drive it out of you. Okay. Fair enough. Now, I, the I wanted to ask you next about, we've been talking a lot about CIOs and their role and what they can and should be doing and developing leaders on their staff and all. But let's kind of flip the disc over and talk about the business executives on the other side of this. Because as I watch companies go through various digital transformation projects that almost always involve agile and DevOps and combinate new collaborations between the business side and the IT side to to the extent that companies have the two sides. And I think a lot of times it feels that way. Now that they have to work more closely together, but what should business executives be doing? One of, one of your uh, observations is that CEOs today, and especially up-and-coming business executives, need to stop claiming that, oh, I, I'm not a technologist, I'm not going to get into that, that they need to actually become more fluent in IT. And for years, we've been saying that, well, it's the CIOs and the IT people that have to, they have to go three-fourths of the way over that bridge between IT and the business. And you're saying it's time for the business people to, like, kind of start bellying up to the bar on this. So uh, talk a little bit more about that, about where that where that conviction of yours comes from, and then how exactly yeah. business executives could do that, assuming that they agree with you that they need to be more fluent in technology. So, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that, but I'm actually a liberal arts major as an undergrad. I'm a criminal justice major. Oh, and, well. <laughs> All and right. I'm an Intel analyst, yeah. right? So I'm yeah. an intelligence analyst. In 1985, we automated the Intel branch. And I had a choice. I could sit there and tell people to do the IT thing, mm -hmm. or I could learn how the IT thing does it. 
And then maybe I can make a difference in the way those people grow and operate in the future. Well, it worked. Yeah. I'm the CIO today because of that drive. Mm-hmm. Because I'm, I, I was technically proficient in the, in the automated message management, in mm-hmm. the automated systems that ran Intel. So if you don't take a professional interest in the technology that drives your business, and you're going to let a CIO tell you which technology is going to do it, then you're not, you yourself as the executive leader, the CEO is not partnering with the technologist to deliver the best results for the business. Mm -hmm. You are disabling the collaboration that's critical to manage the second largest capital investment in your own company. It's not enough to say you don't have technology skills anymore. Not a single millennial cares that you think, you know, cares about Mm -hmm. that stuff. Their stuff, their native skills are as good as our best skills. Well, that's kind of freaky. So we we have to up our game because if we, if you're running the show and you're you're engaging people to make value out of things, then you better know how they're doing it in the technology. Now I don't think you need to run the box, but it's pretty right. bad when I run the I know how to run the CFO's system better than the CFO does, and I'm the CIO and I got all the systems, mm-hmm. but I know more about his tech than he'll ever know. And is that appropriate? Well, probably, but. You should at least have some desire to understand how that system works when the ADP payroll has a hiccup in it and understand that you've seen this before, so you don't have to panic about it. That's Mm -hmm. not how it works. That ADP payroll doesn't run. You can bet panic is right around the corner because people aren't going to get paid. It's you can't always look to the IT guy. You got to have technical skills within each staff, each function Mm -hmm. and at all levels of the organization from top to bottom. You know, in the military, we had a saying, you have to be tactically and tactically proficient. Yeah. That doesn't happen by accident. It takes by, it happens by an investment of time, energy, and, you know, you got to continually educate yourself on the capabilities of what you're trying to deliver. You have to help the CEOs, the COOs, the CFOs, they have to help the CIO be most effective. Mm-hmm. You can't throw the bu- the money bucket over the back of the boat and say, hey, go figure out what to do with this and expect great results. Yeah. So well, we make great results happen most of the time, but mm-hmm. it's not it's not it's not a, a balanced uh, playing field. No, and it, it does seem like the kind of the teeter totter between the IT and technology and CIO skills and the rest of the business is getting certainly more heavily weighted toward businesses relying on their technology. But when I, I'm, I'm thinking about a business executive listening to this and wondering, okay, well, uh, you know, Bob might be right. I, I really should increase my technology and technical skills. What do I do? I mean, what, what are some basic recommendations you would make? Well, the first thing I would do if I was, if I was an exec wanting to find out, I'd want to get learning about, I want to learn a lot more about this technology business management suite. Mm-hmm. And I actually bring that proactively to the CEO and I say, okay. this is how we're managing the technology. This is how it applies. And then what I do is I hold technical showcases for them to attend whenever they do an executive visit. Mm-hmm. Our, whenever any executive visit visits the IT organization in SAIC, we put on a show on technology making the business better and how we do it with the people who actually do the work so they know that it's not a um, it's not it's not the 200 guys down the road writing code that make your difference it's this guy guiding those 200 people based on what you've asked them to do to get to a result you've tried to achieve that's where it comes to be important um, it's really not um, you can't just say, hey, the IT guys will fix it. A good mm-hmm. example is, you know, we have security inspections, right? Now, the IT department isn't really the top, you know, top of security guys in the business. They're, they're cert- they run in a security parameter that the business allows it to run in. But when something breaks, security, invest- uh, security inspection isn't satisfactory. It's related to anything with a computer in it. The tech guy, the IT guys are right there with them. I think this is a fundamental leadership issue that I really think we can clo- almost close on. Mm-hmm. And that is, it's you can't let the problem be handled by somebody else. Okay. All leaders That's own the problem through the whole life cycle of the problem. If the IT is not working and you call the IT department and, and you don't get the results you want, then go, let's address the problem. Yeah. Don't let the thing fester and create a worse problem because there's no inaction. 
That's why we converted the organization from the organization of no to the organization of how. Mm -hmm. It's not, no, we can't do it. It's how can we do what you want to do and still stay within the parameters of our certifications and our guidelines? Good. That's that's a different kind of question and a different kind of solution set that you have to work through. Well, and it also ends up building a different relationship with the business people you work with. Yeah. The other yeah. side of this, by the way, is if you're an exec and you don't understand the basic technology that runs the business, yeah. I'm a really, really expensive help desk for the executive help desk program. <laughs> and when I have to come fix your phone 50 times, yeah, that's pretty expensive. And that's that's 50 times things that I could be doing that would make the business run faster, yeah. run more efficiently than I'm spending fixing your telephone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, let's wrap up. We are at our uh, we're at the end of our chat. This went awfully fast. Um, let's uh, have you hand out a little of your best advice for your fellow CIOs, and then uh, give us an idea of what you plan to do with life after CIO. You're not going to just go fishing and disappear. So, what kind of stuff do you have planned for retirement? And before you go, what's your best advice for other CIOs? You know, I, I think. Um, the most important advice that I would tell you is I've done a lot of the CIO mentor programs where I've mentored five separate groups from around the globe. Mm -hmm. And almost universally, one of the things that comes up is they want more time to be strategic. Stop that noise because everything we do is strategic. Every time you touch the system, in my world, 16,000 people are affected. Mm -hmm. Every time you add some, a capability, 16,000 people get more capability. Stop worrying about what you're doing is strategic and make sure the things you do are make, make a difference to the business. If you're making a difference to the business, you're being strategic every day. Okay. So if you're in a growing role coming up to want to be a CIO, your current CIO worried about your seat at the table, I'll give you some advice. The seat at the table comes when you perform. So uh, uh, from everything else, just perform best you can. Mm -hmm. And then from there, the seat comes. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't really care if I have a darn seat. In case anybody doesn't understand it, you go to a board meeting. Now, this is going to be really hairy, but you go to a board meeting and you sit there for two days and you have a block of two minutes. Yeah. So that's a lot of time to be sitting there and you better be absorbed in how the business runs and what the objectives of the board is. Yeah. But it's a great learning experience. Mm -hmm. I could think of uh, two, uh, two days and uh, two less minutes that I could be spending doing a hundred other things. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a very interesting perspective. I just think that performance drives it and you get your seat at the table based on performance, not based on you telling them you need a seat at the table. Right. I've never worried about what comes. I mm -hmm. always worry about how things are going to, how I'm doing and making a difference with the business. So I don't worry about the other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what am I going to do in the future? Yeah. Well, uh, I have to reconnect with my spouse, which I haven't done very well <laughs> in the last 16 years. I spent uh, I spent two weeks with her at Christmas, and it was the first time in 16 years we'd spent more than 10 days together uninterrupted. Ah, uh -huh. that's a long time. Yeah, uh, time to get back to some basics there. Mm -hmm. Get a little more fit. I'm not going out to dinner every night with the with all the vendors, so yeah. maybe I can drop a few pounds. But uh, I'm going to serve as a coach, uh, mm -hmm. executive coach. One of my plans is to try to serve as an executive coach with the Pathways program, yeah. if they'll have me, and then. Um, I would like to create a teaching practice in, in North Carolina to kind of share some of the concepts that we talked about today in a more structured environment. Mm -hmm. If I could teach as a part-time instructor, adjunct faculty, uh, doing some of this work in the university setting and try to guide the future university platforms in the right direction for TBM, technology business management, or the CIO mm -hmm. maturity cycle, I would like to do that as well. Um, and then finally, if a board, I would love to serve helping a company advise itself on how to do the best investment in it, on technology for itself. As a board member, I, that it's a little bit, it's a new role that's coming out. We're seeing more and more technology type panels yep. in company boards. But uh, I think that's where my, my value could continue to contribute. And uh, if I'm a value of anything okay. on a well. good day. I rather think you will be a value of anything. And I will look forward to seeing you at any of our CIO events that you want to go to. And I'm glad you're going to continue working with our CIO Executive Council. 
And I have, uh, I, I just have no doubt that we will hear from you more in the future, Bob Fecto. So thank you so much for joining us today and giving us such a great and uh, detailed download of all your wisdom. Thanks, Mary Fran. You're we'll very you welcome. See you later. If you joined us late for this very lively conversation with Bob Fecto, you can watch the uh, full episode later today. It will be on CIO.com, and you can even catch it now on Twitter, which is at CIO Online. And then it will also be on our YouTube channel, which is Tech tech talk on youtube uh you can listen to an audio podcast of this wherever you get your podcasts and i hope you will join us for our next episode which will be tuesday april 16th at 2 p.m i'll be joined by sarah nackvi who is the executive vice president and cio of hms host international incorporated Please do subscribe to our Tech Talk YouTube channel, and you'll be able to find all the previous episodes of CIO Leadership Live. Thanks so much for being with us today. I hope you'll join us again next time, and we'll look forward to seeing you then.